I have a deep confidence that the hand of God is upon us for good here at Bethlehem in many ways, but especially in the calling of our ministers. Let me describe briefly what I think the Lord has done for us in the past year or so and what I think he is aiming to do in our church. About 14 months ago, the church called me to be pastor of this church and to devote myself primarily to the ministry of the word and to the prayerful oversight of our total ministry together. During those first months together, we prayed and we thought together about what our priority should be in ministry that should guide the selection of an associate pastor. And the priorities upon which we decided were that we need a person who could equip us for a ministry of outreach and a ministry of nurture through the development of a network of small groups in our congregation. To that end, we called in February Pastor Glenn Ogren. We saw a vital link in those two things between life in group, small togetherness, and dynamic, effective, joyful outreach. Then, all along, it was also our priority to minister effectively to our youth. And to that end, we've called Tom Steller to work with our college people, Corey Dahl to work with our high school youth, and Greg Heinch to work with our junior high. At the other end of the spectrum are the elderly, many of whom cannot come to our services because of their ailments and their infirmities, but want very much to feel a part of us and experience as much of the ministry as we can take to them. And to that end, the church, even before I came, sought the help of David Carlson, who works in visitation with those people. And then last month, we added Bruce Leafblad to lead us in the ministry of music and worship. Now, the upshot of this configuration of leaders is that we are in the infant stages of our ministry together. And there is so much potential that lies before us in things that can be done together. And one of the areas in which there is tremendous potential, and the area I want to focus on this morning, is the possibility of the emergence within our congregation of many smaller forms of togetherness whatever name you want to use. And Glenn and I have been praying over the past several months as to how to encourage that and what form such a multiplication of groups in this congregation should take. And I'll save our specific suggestions to the end of the message. What I want to do mainly this morning is to provide, as well as I can, a biblical foundation for why we believe it's essential and part of normal Christianity for each of you to be involved in some form of small Christian togetherness and not just big groups and big gatherings. Some kind of spiritually sensitive small group. We are issuing this morning and we'll issue in the mail this week a call to small togetherness. And this morning's effort is simply to give the biblical foundation for that. We're going to continue it next Sunday as a climax to the weekend of joy, to which I hope, by the way, you all plan to come, including the Harvest Festival dinner on Friday night. But this morning, the biblical foundation. We want to look at several passages of Scripture because our hope is that you will sense this call to small togetherness, not as a call from men, but as a call from God. And to do that, I think you have to be shown that it comes from Scripture. So let's look together at several texts. The first one I want to direct your attention to is Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12 is the Magna Carta of church ministry. It's the blueprint, as it were, of the living 
body of Christ. It's the means by which God intends for his body to become healthy through the health of its cells. Back in verse 8, Paul says that Christ ascended after he was raised from the dead. And in that ascension gave gifts to men. But then in verse 11, those gifts are described in terms of people given to the church. He says, and his gifts were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Now, most of us can keep clear in our heads the origin of. And the goal of ministry in the church. We know that the origin is Christ. Who gives gifts and gifted ministers to the church. And we know that the goal that Christ has in all this. Is the upbuilding of the saints in faith, knowledge and fervent genuine love. But what we don't keep as clear is the connection between the goal and the origin. The process that God intends to bring those two together. Notice carefully what it is in these two verses. God gives to the church spiritual leaders, pastor teachers, evangelists in our day. Their role, he says, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. And from that work of the ministry comes the upbuilding of the body in faith, knowledge, and love. So God's pattern is to produce a people of faith and love, not so much through the upbuilding by pastor teachers, but through the upbuilding at the grassroots level of the laity. And the function of the pastor teacher is to equip the laity to do just that. And you know that the saints in this verse are not a, a class of Christians. You know that already, I'm sure. Saints in Paul simply means those who have set themselves apart for God through faith in Christ. It's believers. The ministry of the church for the upbuilding of the church belongs to the saints. That's the thing that's very often neglected and overlooked in God's pattern. So according to God's design, the building up of the church in faith and love is not the immediate result of the ministry of the pastor. It's the immediate result of the ministry of the laity. Now, the question that that raised for us very practically in our church is whether or not the forms of our togetherness in this church are sufficient to provide an arena in which that kind of ministry is happening and can happen. And Glenn and I are convinced that the answer to that question is no. The forms of togetherness that presently exist are not sufficient to provide an arena in which that ministry can happen. We have four basic forms. Sunday morning for high exalted worship of the Lord. Sunday evening for that multi-generational, more informal time of study and praise and telling one another what the Lord is doing and what we believe he wants to do among us. Sunday school for the inculcation of biblical knowledge and Wednesday night for larger corporate prayer. And we're convinced that those four forms of togetherness are not enough in order to allow for the kind of ministry to happen which the Bible is calling to happen in a text like Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. And so the question arises, what shall we do? And our conviction is that we must summon you to a smaller form of togetherness where that sort of thing can happen, where you are free to do the work of the ministry as you're called to do it in the Scripture. Now, let's look at several other texts which I think have led believers through the centuries to this conclusion and repeatedly, especially at the high points of church awakening, 
have led groups of Christians to band together in smaller groups and pray for one another and encourage one another in the faith. Some people might say, and I think we're inclined to say, well, now isn't that kind of thing really a luxury in the Christian life? Isn't it just for the super spiritual? Isn't normal Christian life something different than that? And this gathering together once a week and praying and sharing and singing, that's just for the the far out people. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. I think when people read Hebrews 3, not many stop to realize what this text says is at stake in the mutual admonition and exhortation and warning that takes place among believers. Let's read it together. Hebrews 3 verses 12 through 14. Take care, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it is called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we share in Christ, or more literally, we have become sharers of Christ If only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. It happens in churches. It it has happened in this church that a person becomes gradually deceived by sin and its attractiveness. Slowly becomes hardened to the things of the spirit and falls away. From the living God into condemnation. Now I believe in eternal security. But I also believe on the basis of verse 14. That only those will be saved in the end. Who hold their first confidence firm to the end. That is, in order to be saved, we must persevere in faith. That means we may be sure of two things when you put those two together. If a person forsakes the Lord and abandons the faith, we may be sure that person was never born of God and that the renewing, kindling, preserving, sealing Holy Spirit never truly dwelt. In their life. And the other thing we may be sure of is that if a person is truly born of God and is indwelt by the renewing Holy Spirit, that person will persevere to the end in faith. That was the teaching very clearly in 1 John 2.19. They went out from us because they were not of us. Because if they had been of us, they would not have gone out from us. But since they went out from us, we know that they were not of us. That text teaches very clearly that there is an eternal security for those who are truly of the Lord, but also that in order to be saved, you must persevere to the end in faith. Those who are born of God and have the seed of God within them will fight the fight of faith successfully to the end and therefore bear witness To their regeneration. You can tell whether someone has learned their doctrine of eternal security from the Bible or not by whether they say that eternal security makes warnings and exhortations superfluous. If a person says, I'm eternally secure. I have believed in Jesus. Therefore, you need not warn me about falling away and you need not exhort me to persevere to the end in faith. That person has not learned his doctrine from the scriptures. But if he says, I believe with all my heart and am truly and deeply and restfully confident that the Lord will 
cause me to persevere to the end in faith. But I know the deceitfulness of my heart and that my heart is prone to heed the deceitfulness of sin. And that therefore I know I will only persevere to the end in faith if I take heed to the warnings and the exhortations of Scripture and those which come from my brothers and sisters. Then you know that person has learned his doctrine from the Scripture. And I pray that our church will have a biblical doctrine of eternal security. Now the upshot of this for our purpose this morning is that God's wise way, His design to cause His people to persevere to the end in faith and so be saved at the judgment day is to bring about among the members a daily, constant, mutual exhortation to believe. That's what the text is teaching. His way to keep His sheep secure is through regular warnings against falling away, exhortations to trust in Christ. That, of course, has tremendous implications for the way I preach. I'm sure you've all known that already. But notice, the text does not say, take care, pastors, to exhort your people daily. It says, take care, brothers, take care, sisters, to exhort one another Every day, as long as it is called today, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart. Christ gives pastors to the church. The pastors equip the saints. The saints do the work of the ministry, which means they exhort one another. You exhort one another every day so that faith is built up, secured and perseveres to the end. You become God's instruments In causing each other to persevere. Eternal security is a community project. You are responsible for the eternal salvation of professing believers in this church. And we do not know whose destiny hangs on a choice word fitly spoken in a moment of earnestness from our very lips. You see what's at stake in the ministry of the laity according to Hebrews chapter 3? Now how is that kind of ministry going to happen at Bethlehem? We believe that without the emergence of many smaller groups, it isn't going to happen. At least it isn't going to happen to the degree that New Testament Christianity is commending it to happen. You can't give or receive the kind of pointed and fitting exhortation and warning and encouragement that is perfectly suited to a person's need when you're on the run and you only have casual acquaintances. It's not enough. It's just not enough to have it given from the pulpit. We need to know each other. We need to form abiding, deep, trusting relationships with other believers in this church. You can't speak a word fitly spoken for exhortation if you don't know people. And if you don't meet regularly, you can't know them. You don't get to know people by passing on Sunday morning, even in Sunday school. Therefore, we believe it's essential that all of us seek the kind of regular, smaller togetherness where the ministry of the saints can happen. Now, when the saints do the work of the ministry, the goal is not only the strengthening and the preservation of faith to the end so that we will be saved. The goal is also the stirring up of one another to love and good works. Out of these groups we envision that ministry outward will happen. Love is the aim of faith. Faith works through love, Paul says. It works its way out into the community. The groups are never an end in themselves. Hebrews chapter 10, if you'd like to flip over to Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. The writer exhorts us like this. 
Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now notice again, it does not say meet together so the pastor can stir you up. Or meet together so the pastor can encourage you. It says, consider how to stir each other. Encourage one another. And we've asked ourselves again and again over the past months, what forms of togetherness will allow Bethlehem to fulfill that command? And we believe that it's the emergence of many small support groups. History has shown from the beginning of the New Testament right on to our own day that the way God works to stir his people up to love and mission and vision is to often gather together smaller bands of praying people who lay themselves open to the leadership of God's spirit and then who get a vision for service and work together to bring it about. Where will the new works of mission and charity emerge in our church if not from the holy brainstorming of small groups gathered together for zealous prayer and discussion of God's work? But not only vision for love is given in such groups as people meet in the Holy Spirit, but also strength to keep on loving. It is not easy to love for 60 years unrelentingly and do good works for a whole lifetime. It is not easy. Therefore, we need much lifting up of the downcast. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 says, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. The Christian life is a life of love, And good works flowing from the heart of faith in God's promises. But there are tremendous, innumerable obstacles to love. And great threats to faith. We fall down. We trip and get knocked down. And we need picking up. It is not God's purpose for anybody to have to be in isolation when he has fallen. On the contrary. Doesn't it say in Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ? It is a law in the Savior's kingdom, a sweet law in the Savior's kingdom that nobody, married or unmarried, man or woman, young or old, nobody be alone in the bearing of their crushing load. That's not God's way. And yet it is happening in our church because we are a big church with not enough small togetherness among the members. In order to obey the law of Christ, we believe that one must build close, trusting relationships. Otherwise, you don't even know the burdens. Do you know the burdens of anybody near you? And if you don't know them, there is no way then you can begin to share their weight. And we believe that those relationships can only be formed in small, regular groups of believers. Now, one of the burdens of life that we have to bear and ought not bear alone, and that often makes us physically ill, it is so grinding, and which hinders love and good works, is hidden sin. And that's why James 5.16 tells us, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Now, where in the world is that going to happen? Where are we going to feel free to confess our sins to one another? The answer is surely only in smaller forms of togetherness where people have won our trust and who know us and who have committed themselves to us with an authentic accountability that we can bank on, like a rock, there you might feel free 
to confess your sins and have them share that load and help you overcome it. And what about praying for each other? The larger the group, the more impersonal the prayer. But are not the most burdensome, crushing needs for prayer the most personal? Where then will it happen if we are to obey the command in James 5.16? We believe it will only happen as believers gather together in smaller, regular forms of togetherness. One might suggest, well, I can pray for a person's need that they whisper to me in passing at home alone. Yes, you can and you should. But if we forsake that banding together in prayer, here's what we miss. If two or three of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in their midst. Do we need any other incentive to get together to work for each other's faith and love to the glory of our Savior's name than that He will be with us? And I take that to mean with us in a way that He is not with us when we are alone. It is unique. It is powerful. It is special and obvious. Is it any wonder then that Jesus always sent His disciples out two by two? The twelve in Mark 6, the 70 in Luke 10, that Paul always traveled with his Silas, his Barnabas, his Luke, his Timothy, and that even in the 12, Jesus saw fit to breed and cultivate that core of affection in the three, Peter, James, and John. In summary then, the biblical basis for Developing smaller forms of togetherness in our church is that God intends for ministry to be done by the saints. He intends for you, as you are equipped by the pastor teachers, to build one another up through mutual exhortation and encouragement and warning. The aim of that is to build up faith and love. And God's way is that human, Support and human encouragement be used to sustain faith and to overcome the hindrances to love. And that kind of mutually caring ministry does not happen in large groups. It only happens when smaller groups emerge in a church. Now let me conclude with some practical suggestions and examples. Our aim is to be as flexible as possible in our encouragement of small groups. There is no one kind or one frequency or one size or one format of group that will meet everybody's needs. We're happy to let the Word of God and the Spirit of God go to work on you and move you to each other in the creation of groups that we may not have even dreamed of. We're not going to lay one form on the whole congregation. For example, just to mention some of the most obvious ones, I can imagine a group of housewives meeting together for lunch and prayer once a week. I can see three or four businessmen gathering together for breakfast to pray together and to talk about the concerns of the day. I can see a group of high school students meeting together after school or in the evening to talk about the problems of being Christian in school and then praying for one another's difficulties. I can see a group of couples or a group of singles or a mixed group gathering together once a week or every other week in a home in the evening to perhaps read a pertinent book together or discuss mutual concerns and then to pray together. And on and on the list of kinds of small togetherness could go. I'll be writing in the star this week what I think some of the essentials are to every group because I don't have time to do that this morning. So pick up on that whenever you get the star. Let me close with some examples from my own experience. When I was in seminary, I was in four groups at one time. They overlapped, at least. On the one hand, our Sunday school class, which is a big group of couples, the men gathered together for prayer in the morning. I remember riding my bike at 7.30 in the morning to Jim Keener's apartment. And we would pray for just a half an hour, only pray, and we prayed about those things that day which were a threat to our faith and our peace in the Lord and some ministry that we had. The other group 
Five or six of us met once a week, one semester, in Professor Dr. Fuller's office to pray for him and for him to pray for us and for us to pray for each other, for the unique kinds of concerns that seminarians have to struggle with as they encounter all kinds of new things in theology and in the Word. The third group that I was in was my senior year, the last semester. Marcia Sayre and Brian Reed and I went up to the third floor of Peyton Hall in an empty classroom on Monday morning, and for an hour we talked about how uncertain we were of what it would be like after graduation. We didn't know what was coming. None of us had a call. None of us knew what God wanted us to do. And to that end, and that end only, we prayed for each other. Marsha's a missionary now in the Near East. Brian's a pastor in Southern California. And the other group was that I was very privileged with another group of guys to meet with our pastor once a week for several months for breakfast to talk about his concerns and to let him share with us some of his burdens. Today, we're friends with people from every one of those groups ten years later. And those times I look back on as absolutely crucial in my education and development. And today, I haven't lost that same desire for those kinds of relationships, nor that need. So today, I'm in three groups, and I'll tell you what they are. And you can pray about them. Number one, our staff meets on Wednesday at noon to share in the Word, talk about the ministry, and pray together. Two, I meet with the interns Monday afternoon every other week for an hour and a half to hear their burdens of ministry, to tell them mine, to share in the Word, and to pray for each other. And three, Glenn and I meet on Tuesday mornings at 8 o'clock for about an hour and a half to talk about the ministry and to pray for each other and to pray for you. Whether that's all I need, I'm not sure. But those three are there, and I don't think any of the people in those groups know how important they are to me. I encourage you very much as we conclude to pray about what the Lord wants you to do. There's one final example that might encourage some of you. It was a great godsend to me because it wasn't planned in the least. Noel, my wife, Mavis, Glenn's wife, and June, Bruce's wife, quite independently of any of my leading, have already decided to meet together every other week or so for their kinds of unique concerns and to pray together. I hope that that happens in your life. Shall we stand? Lord, I know that for these kinds of small forms of togetherness to emerge and emerge fruitfully, your spirit must lay it on the people's hearts. And only if this is a word from you as seen in the scripture will that happen. And I pray that they have seen it is not my idea nor Glenn's. It is from the Lord. Many of us have tasted the sweetness and the power of such forms of togetherness. Lay it on us all, I pray. I pray that our men will band together in small forms of togetherness and pray for one another. And our women and couples and singles and old and young and all kinds of mixtures and configurations. Lord, my main concern is that people leave this morning praying for leadership. Let them not rush headlong into the formation of a group. Let them wait, read the star, read the card, pray all week, and lay themselves open to you and what you would have them do. And then, Lord, begin to fit them together with people that can minister to each other beautifully. I ask that you do it for your great namesake and for our great good. In Jesus' name, amen.